Welcome back to the Licensed Game Hole, where we're taking off for Zepho as we continue Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order. We're still working out how we want New Form LGH to go, and we've decided that our current pace here is not ideal. While it's cool to go over all the details, we want this show to be more of a recap review show and less of a heavily edited LP, which feels more like what we've been doing. Let's up the pace and cover a whole three planets in this vid! Well, three planet visits, at least. You'll see. Zepho is home to a huge storm, but remembering that Cordova mentioned something about peace in the eye of the storm, Cal insists on a landing. Zepho is absolutely huge, and quite varied, with snowy cliffs and huge windmills that you traverse over, ancient ruins, and caves containing abandoned Imperial bases. The Empire still has quite a presence on this planet, as we fight plenty of stormtroopers. Their strength is in numbers, and that's great for us because the double-sided lightsaber can tear through the weaker ones, or easily deflect the many shots of a heavy assault trooper. Going to Dathomir first did pay off. We also stumbled onto the most important button in the game, the Talk to BD-1 button. Hey BD-1, just checking on you. You seem happy. How are you feeling BD-1? Good, I'm glad. The way that BD-1 bounces and dances when you talk to him is so cute! Ah! There are a ton of paths and areas to check out on Zepho, most of which is still locked off by other powers we don't have. Our destination on this trip is the Tomb of Ram, the first of those ancient tombs that Cordova wants us to explore. This is basically the equivalent of a Zelda dungeon with this one's theme being wind, as we open up fans for jumping and ball pushing. We see some of the Zepho technology here with these Tomb Guardians, before getting our prize as Cal regains Force Push. A classic Force power, Push lets us get through various crumbling walls, but it's also great in combat, especially against rocket troopers. Every time you blow a dude up with his own rocket, it's super satisfying. Push also opens up the skill tree some more, so new powers also mean new skills. After we get Push, we find the Isle Ram sarcophagus, where Cordova's hollow self makes sure to point out some bark that came from the Wookiee homeworld of Kashi. We're gonna see some Wookiees? Hell yeah, we love those furry guys! Before we leave though, we have to solve a puzzle. This isn't too much of a puzzle, as we just need to get three balls on three switches. Once we have Push, we just have to make it back to the Mantis, but there are even more paths open on Zepho, and we can't help but explore them all. In our explorations, we find the oddly named Scomp Link for BD-1. The best powers in Metroidvanias are those which can be used to open paths, but also make combat or exploration more interesting. The worst are things like the Scomp, which is what we call a key power-up. Not because it's super important, but because all it does is unlock doors and chests we couldn't open before. Still, that's even more Zepho exploration, so we make sure to do a pretty full sweep before we leave. We've got to take some time here to praise the way the collectibles give you some good lore information. There are various stories we find the traces of on Zepho. A memorial built by the villagers to fallen clones reminds us that they never knew the truth, thinking the Jedi were traitors. It feels bitterly ironic that this memorial stands on a planet where the Imperials later came and wiped the natives out for artifacts. We find echoes of Project Augur, the Imperial Relic Operation, like a pot broken by an officer upset at not finding what she wanted, until we find the skeleton of the officer herself, trapped and killed in a collapse while trying to hide a relic. It's a lot of fun to find these pieces and see how they connect. You really feel like an explorer as you discover these lost tales. When we finally get back to the Mantis, they're under attack from an ATST, and we're right into our first boss. This is just a basic skill test, as your main form of damage is deflecting its lasers and pushing back rockets and grenades, and it's a big old pushover. Watch out for the officer afterwards, though! Aw, oh, buddy, you really thought that would work. Inside, Cal tells Seer that not only did we find the tomb, but we confirmed that the Zepho were ancient force users. As Grease groans that Kashyyyk is also overrun by Imperials, Cal asks Seer why she chose to stop using the Force. Seer tells us a story from the Purge, where she was attempting to protect some younglings and her Padawan, Trilla. They kidnapped Seer and tortured her until she escaped in a prison riot. 
but they almost broke me. And I am not the same as I was, Cal. Trilla didn't survive, and Seer uses this as a reason why we can't give up, as we can't let people's sacrifices be worthless. Deborah Wilson kills it in this scene, her performance showcasing the character's hope built out of pain. We sneak by some Star Destroyers as we head for landing on Kashyyyk, but then discover an ongoing battle between insurgents and the Imperial Army. We get thrown into a really fun sequence, as Cal jumps out of the Mantis, climbs up an Imperial Walker, and takes control of it, blowing up all these Imperial troops with superior firepower is a blast. Afterwards, Saw Gerrera comes to greet and congratulate us. Saw is a character who first appeared on Clone Wars before showing up in Rogue One, played by Forrest Whitaker. Whitaker has since reprised his role on Rebels, Andor, and right here in this very game. Cal tells Saw we're looking for Tarful, and we strike up a deal with him. His resistance fighters will do a frontal assault on an Imperial refinery, while we sneak in and free the Wookiee prisoners. We're used to Kashyyyk and games being a bunch of bridges between tree houses, but there's none of that here. Instead, we've got forested wetlands that surround a huge smoky refinery. Destruction of the environment in the interest of plundering resources is absolutely a tool of imperialism and colonialism. That said, this feels a little Captain Planet. For instance, one of the lore pages tells us that, for every barrel of sacrifice, 200 tons of Imperial waste are pumped into nearby waterways. It reminds us of that Tiny Toons episode where they're grinding trees down in the Amazon rainforest to make literal toothpicks. It's a little simplistic, and maybe building on it would have helped? Seeing some dying wildlife or sick Wookiees would have been a good way to make the Empire's actions sink in. What if we had to wear a gas mask because the poisonous emissions are so bad? Or, how about we get really biting with it, and make it clear it's not just the Empire, but a Coruscant corporation working in tandem with them for profit? As it is, it just feels like it's going, wow, the Empire will do any evil, but with nothing actionable to latch onto in the real world. This is one of several things that make Kashyyyk, well, a little disappointing. We're still having fun, but some cracks are starting to show. The game gives us the overcharge upgrade for BD-1 early on, which is just another key power-up. It's a slightly more interactive key, as you sometimes have to turn something off at the right time, but it's definitely a key. We find a hidden boss here, but it's just a reskin of one of the normal enemies in the area, with some more health and attack power. We also fight our second boss here, an Imperial security droid that looks like K-2SO from Rogue One. But it's quite easy, and we quickly find out why, because it's just a normal enemy. And when we do a big battle at the end, another ATST drops down, so our first boss also wasn't actually a boss. We're several hours into this game and we haven't seen an actual boss yet. In a Souls-like. Relatively, by the end of the first major area in Sekiro, you've fought a boss and several unique mini-bosses. Now, there's been plenty of enemy variety up to this point, which is nice, but you gotta give us a real boss, Respawn. And we're all about Wookiees, but they look so weird, don't they? Something about the way they do the fur here just looks... bad? We would have preferred a matted texture instead of all their hair strands doing constant wiggling. After the aforementioned ATSD battle, we talk with Marie Kosen, played by Sumali Montano, and Commander Choisik, who's a friend of Tarful's, and says he'll find him and vouch for us. Cool, so we're going to see him now, right? Nope! Our final disappointment in Kashyyyk is that we don't even get to actually finish the story thread. Instead, we're heading back to Zepho, as the Imperials have started Project Augur back up, which means they might have found another tomb. No cool new Jedi power, no meeting with the Chief, no bosses. Didn't think Kashyyyk would leave such a bad taste in our mouth. As we depart, Grease talks about his gambling habits, and Seer warns him that if he keeps gambling, the criminal syndicate Haxian Brood is going to catch up with him. Grease assures her that it won't be a problem. Yeah, totally believe that. That's why you just happened to mention the syndicate by name. 
When we land, Seer talks with us about our quest, and we're given a dialogue choice here where we can say we have doubts or confirm we're a believer. No idea if this changes anything or not, but hey, we think this quest is great. Hell yeah, we believe. We head through the crash site of Republic Venator and into the Imperial Dig site, where we quickly find another new ability for BD-1, which is the ability to go up zip lines. This is kind of a key upgrade, but also it's really fun to go up zip lines, so who are we to complain? Wee! The dig site ends at an elevator where we run into an old friend. She wants Cordova's holocron, but naturally Cal's not giving it up, and we are into an actual boss fight! Second Sister is a ton of fun to fight, too. She likes to jump forwards and backwards, running away before jumping in with attacks, and her combos feature delays to keep you on your toes and often lead into an unblockable attack. You've got to keep deflecting and dodging, keeping an eye out for the small moments where you can get an attack in. She also likes to taunt you to try to get you to run towards her. God, if she wasn't already super hot, the way she cuts into the ground with her lightsaber would have definitely gotten us to start drooling. God damn! Once we get her to half health, she tosses us through a nearby gate and BD-1 puts up a shield to protect us. With the shield up, she starts taunting us by saying we weren't as good as Seer's last apprentice. She was weak. Cracked in an Imperial torture chair. Surrendered the location of her naive Padawan. They would never have found me. If it wasn't for her. Second sister is actually Trilla, Seer's Padawan, dead only from a certain point of view. She sells some seeds of doubt, telling Cal that Seer sold her out, and she'll sell him out too. She also says that when Seer saw what the Imperials had done to Trilla, she lashed out using the dark side. Right after getting asked if we believe in our quest, Trilla makes sure that you're wondering if Seer should actually have a list of new Force users. Star Wars loves its reveals of who's actually behind the mask, and this one is well done. This stays with a theme the series has of the failure of masters. Obi-Wan and the Jedi Council failed Anakin. Luke failed Ben Solo. Seer failed Trilla. But it stays unique. Seer breaking under torture is understandable, but the Empire has twisted it into a failure on her part, and emphasized that to Trilla. Seer didn't really sell her out. But after some brainwashing, it's easy to see why she would believe that. Still, we're missing pieces of the story, and those pieces are going to have to come from Seer herself. Cal gets on the job of asking her some questions, but Trilla has hacked our comms instead. As we go into the tomb of Mictrol, she keeps taunting us. Constantly. Up until now, we've barely seen Second Sister, so even unmasked, she keeps a lot of her mystery as a villain. After this dungeon, the mystique is gone. It's replaced with the feeling you get watching a Saturday morning villain that can't win but constantly acts like they've won. More of my soldiers breach this tomb every minute. Afraid to face me yourself? Had your droid not intervened, I would have killed you with ease. It's okay, buddy. Just ignore her. I've taken the artifact back to my ship for analysis. Pity you couldn't make it in time. It doesn't matter what you steal. You'll never understand it. Yet you do? You'll find out soon enough. I'll take those on. They don't have much for her to say, so they just keep repeating, I have the artifact and you don't. Nuh-uh, I'm gonna win. Back and forth. It feels very childish. And after that excellent reveal, it's disappointing to hear the two's dialogue turn into this. Also, we can say for sure now that Cameron Monaghan misses more than he hits in the incidentals. He's still fine in the major cutscenes, but we feel a professional VA would have done better getting some of the, wow, look at this level type of dialogue done. The tomb itself is pretty fun, better than the first. It's cool how you wind between a central structure and the nearby cave system, and the central mechanics of magnets along with tangled thorns you need to burn using candles, is fun. You also gotta love watching stormtroopers helplessly try to fight against the Tomb Guardians. You guys are not getting paid enough for this job. You have got to unionize. 
The dungeon climaxes on Mictrol's Hanging Sarcophagus, where we fight troopers and purge troopers. Those black outfit guys. When you see one of them, you know you're in for a fun fight. This was all part of Trilla's trap, though, as they destroy one of the chains and send Cal plummeting. Midfall, Cal's desperate reach for his lightsaber turns into a flashback. You'd think this would be a bad time for that, but no, he's remembering how to use Force Pool. We like the surprise of how you learned this one here instead of touching one of those walls. It's a nice way to mix things up. Pool is great. We've been struggling with grabbing these ropes, and now we can just pull them to us. If we could have one Force Power IRL, it would definitely be Pool. It's just so convenient. Hey, check this shit out. <laughs> now we're killing! With pull and push, we've basically got telekinetic powers, so naturally there's some puzzles of holding things and then throwing them. It's kind of a pain in the ass. It always feels like he just throws things vaguely somewhere in the direction you're facing. We even checked at one point to make sure there wasn't an accessibility option so we could see a guideline of how things are going to be thrown, but we couldn't find one. Finishing the tomb raises the spire of Mictrol. Cordova shows up to highlight a wall mural for us, noting that Mictrol at the Vault on Bogano is holding an object that he thinks lets someone perceive the mysteries of the vault. He also points to the large object on the mural, calling it the Zepho Astrium, and theorizes that it must be our guide towards the object. We need to find an Astrium. Whatever the hell that is. On the way out, we find yet another upgrade for BD-1. Thankfully, this one isn't just an unlocker, but a probe droid processing unit that will let us hack them on our side. Can't wait to try that out. BD-1 apparently finds hacking other droids weird, and Cal says he'd find hacking other people weird. Because causing people to slow down or believe lies isn't at all like hacking? Do you want to get into a metaphysical argument about consent in the Force? We sure don't. As we head back, BD-1 fixes the comms so Trilla can't chat at us, thank god, but we're getting no response from the Mantis. That's weird. Once we're almost there, we run into another boss, Atticus Rex. This guy is maybe our second actual boss? Can't be too sure with this game. He looks like a cool bounty hunter as he flies and shoots at us. But thanks to his constant blaster shots we can deflect, he's pretty easy to take care of. Until he gets to 75% health, when he shoots a taser web that knocks us out. The game will let us fight actual bosses now, but it won't let us defeat them yet. Oh, they even play a little fake game over here where it says reawaken instead of respawn. That's cute. When we wake up, Cal's in a jail cell, and we've got no lightsaber, and even worse, no BD-1. Sad news, we're ending this one on a cliffhanger. You have to join us for the next Jedi to find out where we are and who took our stuff. Let us know what you thought of this episode and our new pace. We think it feels a lot better, but we want to make sure you guys are enjoying it too. Next time in the hole, we're going back to Licensed GBA Quest with Sister Princess. Thank you all for watching, and bye everybody!